God the Son, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 16, we have our Lord Jesus' first reference to the church. And we will look at the passage which begins in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 and following. Matthew 16, 13 and following. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, now he had been around the Sea of Galilee, and he leaves that and heads up north, about 30 miles to Caesarea Philippi. You'll notice that it's named after Caesar Philip. That's all that means. And there are, there are Caesareas all over the place, uh, named after the Caesar. And the Caesar is the name, is the title king. And therefore, if you were to translate this, it would be King Philip. That's all. Nobody asked this question. He asked this question about their faith in who and what he is. And so in verse 13, his first question, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, the replies that are given are flattering, but every one of them is wrong. This is the evaluation of the people. This is what the people around are saying about him. And they're very flattering, as I said, but everyone is absolutely incorrect. They replied, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elijah. See, Elijah was prophesied to come before the Messiah. And still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets, obviously, come back to life. Now, then he turns in verse 15, but what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Now, Simon Peter really is not speaking for himself alone. He's speaking for the disciples. And he answers in verse 16, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What he is saying here is that he recognizes that he is deity. They recognize that he is also humanity. They recognize that he is the anointed one who is uh, the Messiah, the, uh, the promised deliverer of Israel. So this is a strong declarative statement. This, of course, brings uh, words of commendation from the Lord. And in verse 17, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. So he makes it clear that this information is available not from human resource, but by means of divine revelation. These men had believed divine revelation. And this then led him to give a declaration of his program. Now, I'm going to say something that will probably be different than you have heard from many, many resources. When I tell you that, the next words do not have any significance whatsoever. When he says, I tell you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. There has been down through the years multitudes of people who have taken and noted the two words Petros and Petra and tried to build some kind of theology out of it. It's not there. There is nothing in those two words. This happens to be the masculine form. This happens to be the feminine form. But they're the same word. One doesn't mean large, a massive rock, and the other mean pebble. They are interchangeable, depending on the masculine and feminine. I'm sorry to tell you that, though you've probably heard from some very famous Bible teacher that what he is saying here is that your name is Little Rock, but upon this massive rock I will build my church. And then what is the massive rock? Well, the interpreters will come along and say the massive rock is he himself. Wait a minute. I will build. He's not. He's the builder, not on the foundation. The foundation, and we have seen in other places, is what? 
the apostles and prophets. We've already seen that in, in Ephesians. He's not building it upon himself here. He is the foundation according to 1 Corinthians, but that, he's the builder here. And there is no significance in these two things. And there, people will, will uh, some have said, well, no, it means his, his declaration is, the, uh, is the, the, the rock upon which I will build. But his declaration is not from him alone, it's from all of the disciples. Now, uh, they, they'll, and they fight this out over in, in commentary after commentary, and, and it's really uh, uh, a waste of time. The thing that he is, and what it causes is, Everyone overlooks the point of that sentence when he says this, You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. What is the point? I will build my church. That's the point. That's the issue. It isn't the, the rocks. That's irrelevant and immaterial. It has no bearing on the issue. But people are already talking about it. And, the, of course, the Roman church says that the, Peter is the, the rock. Uh, the foundation, the first uh, Papa, which is the, uh, uh, the, tr the uh, Italian translation for Pope. Uh, 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 but that's not what he's saying at all. Uh, and I'll tell you why they, uh, let me go on with this passage. In verse 19, you see, he says, Be he, because he is the rock, he's the first Pope, he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, there are two words that are the key words there, and the, the, te the te tense of those two words is extremely important. For, now, when he says, I give you the keys, what are keys used for? The keys are used to open doors. Let's keep that in mind because we'll come to it in a moment. But in the meantime, let's look, we'll look beyond that. Then he says, whatever you bind on earth you see, will be bound in heaven. And then he goes on to say, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, this is what the Romanism says. Romanism says that because uh, he has the, uh, he is called the, the rock, uh, uh, that's the foundation of the, Peter becomes the foundation of the church, and he has the keys of the kingdom, and then whatever he says on earth uh, is, uh, is the law. And so since the papacy is passed on from Peter to others, uh, when the uh, Pope makes a declaration or encyclical, that is, it's even bound in heaven. And if he loses it for the earth, then it's loosed uh, on the earth. Okay, meaning that uh, if uh, he says that uh, the church uh, uh, priest shall be celibate, it's, it's bound in heaven and on earth. But here is where the problem comes, is in the transla translation of the verb. Because when we read uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, bound and having been, uh, or will be bound and will be loosed, we're talking about a past event. And what happens is that what Peter is doing is simply interpreting what God has already bound and whatever already has already loosed in heaven. In other words, whatever God's uh, uh, word has declared, whatever the, the word of God has declared to be the situation, Peter will have the privilege of making that known on the earth in what he uh, binds or what he looses. Uh, I do the same thing as a pastor. That is, when I tell you that uh, homosexuality is wrong, I'm telling you what the Scripture says, not what I feel. When somebody in another church will say that, that it's just a matter of personal preference, then they are departing from what God has already bound or loosed in heaven, revealed in the Word of God, and, and has therefore, uh, uh, they've departed from the authority of God. And they are, they are therefore uh, acting on their own. And if, if I didn't, if there's something with which I disagree, for example, we have evangelicals today who disagree with the principle of, of uh, uh, women who are pastors. And they are trying now to take what the Word of God says, reinterpret it in the light of the current uh, uh, customs and mores of society. In other words, what they are simply saying is that we've got to find a way around what has already been bound and loosed in, in heaven and revealed in the Word of God because it doesn't fit conveniently into the theology uh, of our church 
uh, and the present uh, women's uh, liberation movement. Unfortunately, too bad, uh, that's the problem, but uh, um, uh, it, it's not going to change. Now, when did Peter use the keys of the kingdom? Well, who spoke on Pentecost for the group? They all spoke, but Peter led the way. Peter opened the doors to the Jews who were gathered from all over the world for the, for the Feast of Pentecost. And then in the 10th chapter of the book of, uh, of uh, uh, Acts, uh, Peter is uh, at the home of uh, uh, Simon the Tanner in, in Joppa, and he's on the roof uh, studying the Word, and God gives him the vision of the great sheet which comes down from heaven in which there are all kinds of animals. And uh, the Lord says, Kill and eat. And Peter says, Not so, Lord. Not so. Uh, for they are unclean. And then God says, Look, what I have declared to be clean, don't you declare to be unclean. Now, three times this happens because Peter is slow. He finally gets the message. As soon as the last vision takes place, uh, there is a knock at the door downstairs, and Gentiles have now come in, and they say uh, that they need the gospel. And Peter now discerns that the vision that he saw was uh, the, de the demand of God God was loosing the gospel to be sent to the Gentiles. Uh, see, he came from the, uh, the, the centurion. Uh, and, uh, and he said, I have determined, therefore, that the word of God was to go to the Gentiles just as it had to the Jews. Now Peter used the keys twice, and there was no more need for the keys to be used. The keys have been used. The keys are finished. They, they're hung up. They never have to be taken uh, again. But you see, uh, that has already been bound in heaven. God had already bound it, and he had loosed it. Peter had to discern it and use the keys in that way. Now, going back to uh, what I said, the, there are three things that are actually brought out in the statement of our Lord Jesus Christ that are uh, completely uh, overlooked because of the fact of the dis discussion over Petra and Petra, uh, Petras and Petra. Uh, and there, the first thing is, notice he says, uh, I tell you, you are the rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. All right, the first thing is that he is going to do the building. The Lord Jesus Christ will build the church. It's not up to us to build the church. It's his responsibility. Notice, secondly, I will build my church. This is future. He doesn't say, I am building my church. He doesn't say, I have been building my church. He says, I will. That indicates that something has to be uh, future to this period of time. The building of the church will be future to the earthly ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. His church does not actually be, become built, start to be built, until the day of Pentecost. And then thirdly, please notice something else. It is His church. I will build my church. It isn't our church. It isn't the pastor's church. It isn't the church that belongs to the congregation. It belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ and to him alone it is his church in fact it belongs to the one who purchased the church with his own precious blood the term which is used next the gates of Hades will not overcome it uh, was clear to the Jews to whom he was writing Matthew was writing to the Jews and the idiom simply uh, the gates of hell by the way are simply a reference to, or greats of Hades, a Hebrew idiom for physical death. Physical death, which he's simply saying this, that his death on the cross would not prevent him from filling the, fulfilling his purpose of his building his church. And of course, we know that he has been very successful in building his church regardless of what man has done with it. It seems so often that he builds his church and man tears it down because man does not line the church up with what the Word of God has to say. And therefore it is very important to, uh, to understand what God has to say about his church. Now let's turn to one more passage. We won't look at a lot of them but just a couple here. Ephesians chapter 1 to uh, note what is the church. Well. 
Ephesians chapter 1. Well, we'll be only have to interrupt in the middle of, a, of his sentence, but we, the whole sentence is so long. Uh, we'll go to, um, to verse 22. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fulfills everything in every way. Uh, now notice that in this passage, it tells us that he is the head, and the head does the directing. And the head's direction is given to us in written form, and that is from the source of the inerrant scripture. The body is called the church. The body is, the head is in heaven. The body is on the earth. But the direction comes from the head to the body through the scripture. And But the body being on earth, the head being in heaven, being he's no longer attackable by uh, Satan, but the body is. And so the body will be the objective of a great deal of attack uh, and all the energies of Satan will be thrown in attacking the body of Christ, the church. But please note what he says, that uh, uh, he, is, uh, he is the fullness. The Lord Jesus Christ is the fullness. Pleroma. P-L-E-R-O-M-A. Pleroma meaning... Uh, full, meaning uh, the one who fills the deficiency. One who fills to overflowing. One who fills with certain qualities. These are the, ba the basic, there are six definitions, but these are the, he is the one who will fill the deficiencies. He fills the church to overflowing. He fills with the qualities which are, are missing. And in the local church, uh, he will do that as well as in the individual, uh, the, the total body of Christ uh, that uh, he will be doing. Remember uh, in, uh, in Acts chapter 1 where he talks about the Lord added to the church daily the ones who were being saved. It's the Lord who adds to the church. It isn't the visitation program. It isn't the visitation team. It isn't the, uh, the clever... Uh, uh, gimmickry that is used. It is the Lord adding to the church. The problem is, as we saw last time, that the church is not doing what God told it to do. Uh, for, for the most part, the church is not baptizing and uh, uh, as well as teaching. Uh, the church is doing everything. I was talking to a gentleman recently who swims with me who is a, uh, a leader in one of the large churches that's building a new building. And uh, he said, I was asking him how things are coming in the building. And he said, well, it's, it's doing real well. And I said, I'm sort of surprised that you put a metal roof uh, on a big building like that. He said, well, it's going to be covered on the top and on the bottom. But he said, that's the efficient way to go now. I said, oh, I'm, I'm really surprised. And so we were chatting, and he, uh, I said, uh, uh, he said, the, the original church, uh, which was a few blocks away, was used, uh, had a larger auditorium and, and just uh, some classrooms. He said, but this new church has, has all kinds of other things. He said, because the younger families that are becoming associated with the church are demanding that the church do more things for their family rather than just have a place for the study and, uh, and worship. Since it's a liturgical church, they do spend a great deal more time in worship according to the Old Testament and they are uh, from the Reformation uh, and they have never made the distinction between the Old and New Testament church either. So. <laughs> but the point, the point that's very interesting was that, that these young couples are demanding that the church become more and more to them as I read to you from the analysis in, the, in uh, Newsweek magazine that they want uh, racquetball courts uh, they want gymnasiums uh, so that they can, the young people can be entertained. Uh, they want all kinds of things in the new church. 
because they have failed to understand what the church is all about, what it is there for. Uh, and therefore, it is a problem in the church. Now, we understand, therefore, certain things uh, from these uh, passages that are uh, immutable. Number one, that is, the church in the Bible never refers to a building. The church, as such, with a capital C, is not a building. It wasn't until the third century that buildings became known by the people who attended the, the church, the, who were a part of that. And, and it's legitimate to refer to a building where the church gathers as a church, but uh, it is not basically a, a building. Uh, the church is really made up of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, wherever they may be. And if someone were to ask me, where is your church? I would have to say, well, at about this time, uh, they are uh, in uh, this job. Uh, they are in uh, in some some are in homes. Some are working in the in uh, uh, general telephones. Some at uh, uh, the uh, uh, Goodrich Tire and Rubber Company. Some uh, uh, are here and there. Uh, wherever they are, that, that that's where the church or my church is. Uh, the for members of my congregation. Uh, well, no, I mean, uh, where is the building? Well, then you understand. You knew that that's what they wanted to know in the first place, but have a little fun with them once in a while. But where is the church? Wherever the believer is, that's where the church is, you see. And this passage that says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst of them, as a definition for the church is ridiculous. That has nothing to do with that. It has to do with doing, making judgments. Uh, it's, uh, it's a principle that's used in the New Testament. If there are two believers who have a problem in the local church, uh, and uh, rather than take it before a court of law, they have the option of taking it before the church. And uh, what happens is that uh, um, one, one uh, uh, asks one member to be on this council, uh, the other asks another member to be on the council, and the pastor-teacher becomes one so that there are three uh, men uh, or women who make up uh, the governing body rather than you could have the whole church decided but uh, this is the way it's done uh, in order to keep it uh, from becoming too widely known or disseminated uh, and so this group here becomes a judicial body that decides it where two or three are gathered in my name then they make a decision it's the same as if the Lord were to make a decision and these people here are to have the mind of Christ uh, that's why they are to be chosen very carefully. And uh, the first uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 6 defines uh, the fact that he, the least uh, in all the church should be able to make up this uh, group of people. But uh, as far as uh, the church is concerned, it is definitely not a building. Secondly, it is definitely never a denomination. Now, we're, we're not against denominations because we're not a denomination. We are not a denomination because that's what the Bible teaches. The Bible very, very clearly teaches that there is no organization over when there is a one person over more than one local church. And therefore, to be obedient to this, that's the way it has to be. Now, I have been in the denomination. I have been a part of denominations in the past. And I know the argument. Uh, they will say, well, you see, we can do things together that you can't do alone as a local church. For example, we can support a missionary. Uh, you are not big enough, perhaps, to support uh, a church, uh, many missionaries, but because we have X number of churches, we go to po pool our money together, we can support missionaries. Well... Uh, when a missionary goes, uh, where does his support come from? No, no, it doesn't come from the local church. It comes from God. God is the one who's supposed to supply for that missionary. Now, he may use local churches, and he does. He has. He uses individual believers. But they are God's responsibility. And the missionary who is going is to trust the Lord for his uh, support from the Lord. Uh, one of the things that is uh, that I have 
hated about mission work generally is deputation. What does that mean? That means that missionaries have to go to local churches and beg for support so they can go to the mission field. And if there, there may be somebody who is an excellent missionary uh, in a particular field who is not a good communicator. And, but if his missionary work is not communication, it doesn't, he doesn't have to be a good communicator. He doesn't have to be a spellbinder in the pulpit. But uh, the church demands that he come with the threadbare clothes and uh, uh, pictures of emaciated orphans to show on the screen so that then he can take an offering uh, so that for his ministry. It, that's tragic, and it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way. But it is. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, it, it, it is. Uh, but... Uh, then, or they say, you see, we can have a camp together that you can't have by yourself. Okay. Well, on the other hand, it is definitely possible to rent a facility for a week or two weeks a lot cheaper than it can be to own a camp for a year round. I can guarantee you that. But there are many things. That's what the impact. No, you see, the, if the impact is an invisible impact from the source of invisible heroes, the size of the congregation or the denomination, it doesn't make a bit of difference. Today, in, over in the, I just don't want this to go over. Huh? No, let's, yeah, stay there. We don't, I, I, I do the radio. I know what goes on. But over in the Coliseum today, there is, there is going to be a, a unity service. All well, not all, all the churches of Fort Wayne are getting together for a great big unity service. It is to demonstrate our unity in Christ and to evangelize the city of Fort Wayne. Now, just hold the phone a phone. First of all, this is an afterthought. They tried to bring in a, the Billy Graham team and, uh, and they had the black fellow who was on the team, his name escapes me now, uh, be, he was committed to come if they could have 125 churches. They only got 90, so the Billy Graham co uh, said, we won't, we won't come. If you don't have 125 churches cooperating, we aren't coming. I thought that was rather small. Plus, you had to, they had to raise a budget of X amount of dollars in advance and they didn't quite make that they were about twenty five thousand dollars short of that they had actually booked the Coliseum for this last week every night for the meetings and so uh, in order to get it they had to put a down payment on it and the down payment uh, covered uh, two days and they could it's not refundable Therefore, rather than lose the money for the two days, they had a youth concert last night and a unity service this afternoon. So, in all reality, uh, this was the outgrowth of expediency and certainly not the great desire. I mean, I know some of them wanted to win the city of Fort Wayne, and they thought that the Billy Graham crusade would do it, you see. But... Uh, 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 it's rather startling. The Billy Graham crusade has been, quote-unquote, very successful in the British Isles, and yet today, less than 2% of the people in Great Britain uh, go to church. I was in just in this week's uh, uh, material that came to me. Less than 2%, a shocking reality. Uh, um, and I'm not saying anything Billy Graham should that's it between him and the Lord and, and it's between them and the Lord but I'm simply saying that this thing uh, and what they're what they have done and the, the thing that bothers me the most is the man that's speaking is the is the pushiest black pastor in Fort Wayne who's pushing himself he is a he's a climber he's in a uh, has inordinate ambition name is Nicholson or something like that it isn't uh, it isn't brother uh, Jesse <laughs> that's the first one everybody thinks about but but it isn't Jesse no it's uh, Nicholson. Uh, he's, he's on Channel 10 uh, uh, all the time promoting himself. But anyway, I, I mention this as saying to you that uh, it is uh, this unity thing of working together 
uh, to, to accomplish what we couldn't accomplish otherwise is hogwash. Okay, we can continue or whatever. Cut back in. Three, the church is very important to God. And I said it last time, but I want to say it again. God has never authorized parachurch organizations. Para means alongside. Now, he may use them, and I was in Youth for Christ for a long time. And uh, I know that at that time, in those days, it was the policy of Youth for Christ that everything should accrue to the local church. The only thing was that the local church uh, was missing out on, we thought, uh, and when I became a part of it, was that, that on Saturday nights, Christian young people didn't have any to go. So, Youth for Christ was formed in the Chicagoland area by uh, several pastors. And they uh, had a Saturday night youth rally. When I was with Youth for Christ in Chicago, we had, we rented the Orchestra Hall, one of the beautiful downtown halls. And every Saturday night, we had a, we had a band made up of young people from across the city. We brought in some of the finest musicians and always outstanding speakers. I got to meet some of the great speakers and the great uh, Christian leaders of bygone era simply because of my association with them. And I got into it by mistake, by, by the back door of all things. I was leading singing at a, a youth uh, a singspiration one night, and the director asked me if I'd come and lead singing for him down at this rally. And I'll never forget the first time I walked out on that stage with all these people there. I nearly wet my trousers. I mean, I'm such, a, I'm such an introvert and so shy, but I had committed myself, and so from there, uh, eventually, I, uh, I, he asked me if I would mind coming in as the club director, and I worked with him uh, and uh, did uh, the rallies on Saturday night and worked with Bible clubs in the schools. That was my association. But our rule was always that everything accrued to the local church, and every person who came forward at the invitation for salvation was always referred to a solid, fundamental evangelical church in the uh, area, in fact, several of them, so that we could be sure that they were followed up. But it's, it, the church is important to God, and the Lord has never bypassed His church. And if He uses parachurch organizations, and apparently He does, because He blesses the gospel no matter who gives it out, even an unbeliever. Some unsafe person could put a sign up that says, Christ died for our sins, and a person could see it and be saved. Can the, the, the unsafe person put it up? It doesn't make a difference. It's, it's the gospel. Some people were preaching the gospel out of contention for, while Paul was in prison. And Paul said, I'm glad the gospel is being preached. That's what counts. And so whatever, wherever the gospel is being preached, we're grateful for that. But the church still has the responsibility of evangelism and uh, teaching. As we saw from Matthew chapter 28, the Lord's command before He uh, ascended. And so, but the church is important. And we always keep in mind the church. And you don't attack uh, the church. You leave the church. And if the church is out of line, you tell the te we teach the truth, but avoid the churches which are apostate, and uh, uh, avoid those things which compromise. Which is just the reason that I don't belong to any of these uh, organizations which are seeking to cause the churches to work together. Not that I am against doing the work, but I realize that the work of the church is the production of invisible heroes who will evangelize day in and day out, and will te and then will bring them to the place where they can teach, uh, sit under the teaching of the Word of God. And if they don't want to come, that's their business. Fourthly. The church, with a capital C, and its obvious result, the local church, is the only organism. I want you to turn uh, with me for just a moment to a passage in Colossians, which, since you were in Ephesians, it isn't too far to Colossians, or Philippians, pardon me. It is Philippians that I want anyway. The organization of the local church is given to us. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 1.
Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, there's your apostolate, there's your the higher authority, which died at the end of the, uh, the death of the apostles, to, then please notice, to the saints in Christ, oh, that means they're set apart in Christ, these are the, the believers, and where are they in the local area at Philippi, so this is a local, a locality, so we have to the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers, now the word overseers is the Greek word episkopos, which looks like this, and is mistranslated bishops by the King James Version. Epi does mean over, and skapos means to see. So overseer is a correct translation. It refers to the pastor teacher, or the pastor teachers of, uh, of the many churches. If there are several churches, there are several pastor teachers. And then we have the third group, the deacons. Now, there's a, a great deal of uh, discussion among uh, the ICE uh, churches as to whether uh, there is uh, the two, two, two areas of discussion. Plurality of, uh, well, when we use the word presbuteros, which is another word for pastor, uh, it's the P-R-E-S-B-U-T-E-R-O-S, -E -E translated old man or uh, 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 elder, whether there is a plurality of elders is one question. The second is, is there a board of deacons? Or are there just deacons? In other words, what does deacon mean? Deacon comes from diakonos, which means basically to stir up the dust, or servant. And we sort of function more on the independent work of the deacons. That is, the deacons each have a, an assigned area of responsibility and they function uh, in that and they are uh, answerable to uh, the pastor and ultimately of course to the congregation but we do not practice plurality of elders either and we have one elder one overseer in the local church and uh, there may be uh, many who have uh, gifts but they will develop uh, eventually but you have here the the local church is made up of uh, all believers overseers and a few people have specialized service gifts and that is the diakonos. Five, Jesus Christ is the prince ruler of the church. He is the one who tells the church what to do, where to do it, how to do it, and it's entirely his church. The question is, does he rule the members of the church? Does he actually control the people who are of made up members of the body, the members of the royal family? Uh, does he control them? And that is the, that's what makes the difference in the operation of the local church. Uh, the local church, if it is filled with people who are controlled by God, uh, will have people who will be functioning under their spiritual gifts so that there will not be lacking uh, areas of service that need to be fulfilled. Uh, the, and under the spiritual gifts, one of the gifts that is given to some people is the gift of giving, which means that they have to have the gift of making money, and so that's another thing that will, will not be missing. In other words, they will have a full complement of what they need in order to function, no matter how big they are, uh, and it doesn't make, take a lot of people for God to provide these. And, of course, you have people then who disdain the local church, who, instead of the local church, uh, will be hooked up to a tape recorder uh, and uh, say that that will be uh, their church, but there is no basis for that. It is, a, it is legitimate for a believer to study the Bible by means of anybody's tapes. That's, that's perfectly all right. But he ought to be a part of a local uh, gathering of believers uh, where he can, his spiritual gift can function in addition to uh, his helping other believers, and at the same time, he also can uh, uh, be together with believers uh, who are members of the royal family. Now, uh, obviously, uh, for example, if I were over in Timbuktu, 
and uh, uh, there were only a few believers, uh, I couldn't maybe have a close fellowship uh, uh, under with a lot of grace believers because there were only so few. Uh, and maybe the local church in that area has to be made up of uh, a number of different types of believers who uh, function together as the local church because they are so few, but they are together. Then I would supplement my, my uh, uh, study with tapes, but I would still be a part of the local church. Uh, our David and, and, and uh, Stephanie uh, have asked if there is a church like ours in the area where they're stationed. Well, uh, from what I can discern, there is not, but I've counseled them to find a church that where the emphasis on salvation by grace and by grace alone through faith alone that even if they aren't teaching doctrine they can uh, they can supplement their teaching of doctrine at the same time have fellowship with that local church be involved with other believers be involved in the outreach and the encouragement of one another uh, because it is important to be an encouragement and when you're not an encouragement to the other believer you are therefore not functioning the way you ought to function function but uh, if you're advancing in your spiritual life, living inside the divine dinosphere, you have accepted God's authority in your life, and then you are functioning uh, somewhere in a local church uh, for the purpose of glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ to the maximum. And so we have the uh, first two points in the doctrine of the local church. And uh, before I begin the next one, I think uh, we'll stop. And we'll pick it up at the next class and take an extra few minutes uh, for our break. Now, thank you, loving Father, for our study. May God the Holy Spirit glorify God the Son. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Remember that the other class still has a few minutes to be meeting.